Hey, this is Kara, you're watching Really Famous. Up next, I'm talking to Talia Shire, and we're gonna get into all of your questions about The Godfather and Rocky, plus her super talented family, which includes Francis Ford Coppola and Nicolas Cage, and you're gonna get to know her on a really personal level. Let's go. Hi, Talia. <laughs> Kara, hi, hello. So this is not our first talk, but let's get into some things that we have not really talked about in depth. New questions. Number one, how did things change between Rocky and Rocky II? So I know things changed. Rocky was a huge hit. So how did things change for you, for Sylvester, and for the whole franchise? Big question. Uh, Rocky was a little movie. Uh, United Artists put that movie out. I don't think they expected that movie to take off, but it did. By the way, Sylvester believed in that movie, so he knew, therefore we knew, that it would be extraordinary, but not at the time of the making of the movie. We were kind of, we were a low budget movie. Um, and you know what, thinking back, now we're talking about, how, gee, my goodness gracious, 1975, we're talking about, way over 40 years. It was earth-shaking. All of a sudden, it's a little movie, then it's this giant movie. And uh, it impacted on my life, obviously. Um, then we were going to do Rocky II. Besides my hair going, you know, that was in Rocky III when I was red-haired. But Sylvester wanted to explore what it was like to have that change. He himself was exploring those things in his own personal life. And it was reflected in those movies, by the way. Now, I haven't seen them in a while, but you'll notice that's the, that is what was taking place. He was, we were just two people who were discarded people. That was the original Rocky. Then suddenly there was the Rocky. Then there was the bigger Rocky. And he was exploring what it was to become a gigantic movie star himself. So I was trying, and remember, Adrian is a partner. She is Rocky's partner, an equal partner. So she was always the, I don't wanna say Jiminy Cricket voice, but she was the one saying, are you sure? What are we doing? Are you afraid? What are we doing? And he highlighted that throughout those movies. Adrian was a partner who asked him to be conscious at all times. And um, you could see that that Adrian was evolving. In my own personal life, so was I. So suddenly I was stopped on the streets. Suddenly it impacted on my marriage. Those are, those are realities, those are big deals. I, did I go around your question or bring no, it back? You answered it. It did, it did uh, answer in ways that we didn't get to before either. So it's very interesting. Uh -huh. And uh, so what I think what we did talk about briefly also was that Sylvester wrote the screenplay of yes. Rocky and yes. he shopped it around and nobody wanted it at first. And then, or I'm not even sure if that's true, but no, they wanted it to buy it from him for other actors and stars. He was not going to give that project up. By the way, Sylvester had a pregnant wife and no money. So he held on to that project because he felt, he, he used the word tailored, that he had tailored it for himself. That was a remarkable act of courage. Brilliant, also, such a smart move. Everybody should make that move. Who well, has yeah. talent? Absolutely. Okay, so what don't people... And one other thing, and I highlight this, I, I bring yeah. this up, but I used to... That Rocky was a celebration of our country, 1776. We were making this movie in 1976. So in es its essence was this, that everybody, even a loser, who's an American citizen, has the right to go the distance. That's what he was talking about, portraying. That's what we were acting. That Adrian, who was a loser, by the way, <laughs> has a right to be in love. Hey, a, don't call Adrian a loser. Well, but what I'm saying, others did. I mean, what is she? Oh my God, that, that girl with the... But 
but but by the way, love can happen. And you have the right to go the, to the distance with the things you dream about if you work hard and with each other and with love. And to me, Adrian changed a lot in Rocky II and the whole Rocky II mood was different from Rocky. And I really have to say, I think that over the years, Rocky II has stayed with me more than Rocky. Isn't that funny? Well, it, uh, I have to be honest with you. I haven't... Yeah, you haven't seen it in ages. Actors don't always... I feel terrible. To, I mean, actors don't always go back and look at, look at, look, look, look at their works. So I haven't, I, I, I suddenly realized while you were talking that I was cutting, I was doing Rocky Three is Rocky Two, But okay. Rocky Two was, was, why did it stay with you? I want to know. I don't know, but it's funny because I saw them when I was growing up, right? I saw oh, probably no. all of them, I guess. And then uh, when I remembered it, I guess what it was, was maybe last summer or something, maybe six months ago, I decided to watch Rocky with my kids who had not seen it. So I was like, oh, let's watch Rocky. And it was funny because I really couldn't remember a lot of it. It didn't seem familiar to me. And then my husband and I were like, you know what? It may be Rocky too that we keep thinking of when we think of the Rocky movies. And so before you and I had our first talk that's on the podcast, I was like, you know what? Let me go refresh my memory of Rocky too. So we watched Rocky Two, and I was like, "This is my movie. This is the one that, that I was, think." That was the one. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? Is that the one with the? That was the wonderful dog was in that movie, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Right. It was really yeah. It was a great. It was a great film. Is that so the zoo scene with the with the uh, earmuffs was in that movie? Yes. That happened, by the way, on in the moment, because there was a snowstorm. And I put on the earmuffs and I said, when he said, will you marry me? Something like that happened. I said, we worked this out, he and I. Can you, can you tell me again? It was a very, very sweet, sweet movie, that one. Very sweet. I loved yeah. it. So speaking of watching yourself, do you watch yourself on The Godfather? Because, you know, The Godfather might just be playing if you're flipping through the TV or something. Do you watch yourself? And if so, how do you feel? No, I did watch Robert De Niro uh, called me and said, you know, we want to do Godfathers one and two. Tribeca does celebration anniversary at uh, Radio City Music Hall, which is, by the way, a place I went to many times as a child. And my father was the uh, chief orchestrator there before I was born at, at Radio City. For, for people who don't know, it is a stunning place. 5,000 people can sit there at Radio City Music Hall. He was going to do Godfathers 1 and 2. So we all went there, the cast, the original cast. My brother was there and my children came and I decided to sit in the audience and watch this movie that way. So you can see on the screen, Francis was behind me. My jaw dropped. It, it's, a, it's a masterwork. It's a piece of art. I'm not talking about nothing to do with me. So people can understand this is not uh, an, the arrogance of ego. This is, I am perceiving a work of art, film art, a masterwork. Four hours later, or whatever that amount of time was, I was overwhelmed with the... Um, the dramatic elegance. I mean, I'm a, I'm a drama school major, so everybody knows. So is Francis, drama school major. He is a great, great writer. That, that, that he brings to anything he does a, another level of uh, creative artistry. I saw that years later. I saw a masterwork, and it, it truly was Francis's masterwork. I, I think I told you this last time, but I was in the audience that day with my dad and right. my dad is a huge, has been a huge Godfather fan his whole life and me too, probably starting with him, but we went that day. And at first, I don't know if I told you this part, but we thought, 
it's going to be so long. Those movies are so long. We've seen them so much. Why don't we just go? I suggested why not? Because he's in his eighties. I said, why don't we go to the uh, second one and then stay for the panel, which we wanted. He said, no way, you crazy. So we sat there for, it was probably five hours or something before the panel. And it was the most incredibly amazing experience ever to be at Radio City with all these people who love The Godfather and just watching it on the big screen, which I had never done before. And little did I know that oh, you were this sitting- this was your first experience of that experience, the way it was designed? Yes. Wow. So uh, that was amazing. So, all right, so how about the part of watching yourself on screen? Because you didn't explain that. So how does that feel when you see Connie yeah, Corleone on screen? I, well, first of all, I was, uh, because that brings other issues into it. The, um, uh, that don't that were are not part of that movie experience, but other issues of how did you get the job, what was going on, the the complexities uh, at the time of Francis's own uh, security that he wouldn't be fired, which was uh, if you heard if you were there that day, he spoke about that. You know, my goodness gracious, he didn't know whether he was going to be fired. And for me personally, besides the creation of a character, that Connie was also, oh my God, should I have even, me personally, Talia, should I have even been on that movie set with uh, a brother who was not anchored in, believe it or not. So sometimes, I, I, you know, I could have been terribly in the way. And... Uh, you know, it's years later, apparently <laughs> I wasn't. So, but I mean, I have to tell you, that's those little asides. Um, but Francis that day did speak about the um, jeopardy his job was in. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. And I remember reading about that too. And it was like, they were not thrilled. And they were, I remember they said it's so dark and everything too. And yes, it was... I I want to explain this to, to your viewers. There's okay. a thing called dailies. Dailies are the work you do every day. We, you and I have been struggling with where I'm sitting here, right? Am I in the dark? I'm in the light. The lighting, yeah. It's not, 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 it's interesting. Now, light and dark and all of composition is how we tell a story in that landscape. So Gordon Willis, the great Gordon Willis, our cinematographer, was shooting in a most interesting way. He and Francis were collaborating on a visual style that was unique. But as dailies that come in, as two minutes, one minute, <laughs> the people at Paramount were going, my God, what is that? I can't see the face. Movies are cut by cut, but it came together. I think Robert Evans had enormous uh, trust to, let's wait, let's see. However, Francis's job was in, in, in jeopardy for a bit of time. Okay, so can you tell me what you had to do with Kay having an abortion? Ah, that can't, that, notice I didn't answer your question about wanting to watch myself. Well, I think, by the way, I think I can, I can tell that your answer is, no, I do not want to watch myself. I don't want to watch myself. <laughs> I consider myself, uh, by the way, I do consider myself very good at reading dramatic literature, what we and, and the spine and the subtext. That's my training. Francis, that day on the stage, 50 years later, right? Revealed, I think it was 45, by the way. By the way, if, was it for, oh God, I'm. It was 72. So if it was 72. Godfather 2, though, what year was that? Oh, Godfather 2 must have been, I don't know, like a year or two later. It was very quickly okay. after. The Godfather 2. Francis and you know brought up which I was rather amazed uh, were siblings. There is a sibling uh, world. Rob, he said, "Did you know?" <laughs> and I'm sitting there. Did you know that that abortion for Kay was Talia's idea? Nobody had known that. I had gone to Francis uh, in Lake Tahoe when we we were beginning, and I was reading the script, and I said, "You know." Now I'm speaking to you as a drama major, someone who likes writing and why not, what if she has an abortion, which is a terrible thing in one family context, right? 
but her thinking is how can I give birth to one more person who might be someone who kills? Horrible thoughts. Whatever you may think, it became an extraordinary dramatic scene for her in Godfather Two. So he finally acknowledged that that was my those that was my thinking. So did you have any control over or any not control maybe but uh, influence over what happened to Connie in The Godfather Part Two and Part Three? Like, did you make suggestions? <laughs> what are we going to do with Connie because you became so self-sufficient and by the way this is a fan question so self-sufficient and powerful as it went on so did, were you whispering in Francis's ear well it, Connie's first of all a very interesting character because in a powerful family of men <laughs> she has to be careful and her life she's oppressed by the way I mean that's an oppressed life and uh it's a tragic life. She has a tragic life, beaten by her husband. He's abusing her and also angry that they, Carlo, that they, he won't have bigger things. There's a setup, there's a beating, her brother is killed, right? Horrible. That's in the book. And quite, God, that's, I, I'm, I'm reflecting on it, awful. In Godfather Three, which Francis calls the coda, it's very separate from one and two. Godfather three, I finally, you know, had a little more oomph because <laughs> I, I tend not to be, di you know, any, you know, okay. I'm careful in how I present an idea um, to any, anybody, to anybody I'm working with. I'm very careful. Um, or family with. Yes. So I, he, you know, he had this, <laughs> I get a, I have to tell you, it's a funny story. I get a phone call to go to somebody who's magnificent with appliances. Appliances are those pieces we add to ourselves. Uh, Marlon Brando had an appliance here. So I was fitted for all these appliances. And I said, cause I, you know, and I suddenly had a giant face here and a giant face here. And so I'm thinking, and I, 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 I called my director, who is my brother, and I said, what, what, this, we were going we to test these. In all fairness, these are make, called makeup tests. So this is for part three? Three, excuse me. Because you had three. to look older? Is that why? Well, because it was many years later, and his, his concept, he thought, was more, I become the mother, right? So I got fitted, and in The Godfather, he does have this great waltz. Remember the waltz? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's really royalty. The queen is dead, long live the queen. The king is dead, long. That's, that's royalty. Well, now the mother is gone in Godfather Three. Who is Connie? Is she now the mother? Well, so I got fitted for these giant uh, facial appliances. And I, we, you do makeup tests. And I, and as an actor, I went and I said, absolutely. But I have this idea, right, that she doesn't wear any of that. In fact, because of the tragedy of her life, she is, and in Godfather 3, Michael doesn't want to be in the mafia. He is leaving it. Would Connie want that? I was thinking, the character, after all of the tragedies in her life. So in a way, on an unconscious level, she was the father. She was reenacting the slick father, right? She doesn't want to end this, this, uh, this tradition of, of, of their mafia. And she brings in her nephew, right? She brings her, so I wanted a, a more, uh, royal and lethal character. And he, we tried it. I mean, Francis is the most, uh, he's collaborative. He is open to ideas. This is a long story to tell you <laughs> that that character and your fan asked a question had an enormous transformation. And she becomes more, uh, she has parts of her that are her dream, her myth of her father. 
not the reality, but her myth of her father because her life was so compromised. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I know, and it really was story, an interesting buddy. story arc for her. I mean, you never would have dreamed it from the Godfather where, yeah. what would happen after that? Um, okay. So how about a specific, uh, but it, how but, about it, it, but it is, if you think about it, what a life, what a horrible, uh, life this woman has had husbands killed children i mean and she's really had the worst of everybody don't you think i mean she really did i think well yeah so i wanted her to be sort of like a a medici you know all the pearls and the hair that's where we were headed okay so tell me something about al pacino like working with him because you did work with him quite a bit so were you kind of like shocked by his presence, like how good he was as an actor, or was it just like, oh, it's very normal. I've been working with Al just like everybody else. No, I, as the theater major and having many friends that I went to theater school with, we were always talking about Al Pacino. Uh, He got the Opie Award. He was just like, he was a a great actor. Every actor back then knew that there was this great young actor uh, off Broadway. What was it, Tiger? I forget which which it was. We all knew about Ah, Al Pacino. Okay. Uh, We all knew about Robert De Niro, acting majors. It was these great, great young actors uh, that were. um, Diane Keaton was a great young actress, you know? So we knew of, of these wonderful actors. So, okay, so you weren't intimidated by any of it. You just were celebrating it because you were in the, you, that was kind of your circle, right? Well, I mean, I have a circle. We, a friend of mine once said, an actor is sort of a species. <laughs> we're, and we change ourselves, we wear a mask. We, we, we are always ex- experimenting with what it is to be the other and to, to use great literature to, to have transformations and, and bring it to everybody as art or healing. So, of course, you're going to know who those great people are. Johnny Cassell, my brother Fredo. Oh, God, are you kidding me? And a great loss for, for all of us. A great loss. So- and also in your own family, so much talent. Like if you look at your family tree, I don't think that everybody, there are plenty of people who are aware who all of your relatives are. Others are really not aware. And I think they would be surprised to find out even that Francis is your brother. Yes, so. I want it. We, 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 because of, of, of going back many years ago, I, listen, it's, he, Francis was a very young guy when he did The Godfather. Can, we must not forget, when he was 26, he got an Oscar for Patton. He was a great young writer. Okay? So, I, you know, just because you're getting accolades doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're secure. If a sister is there, you, you're not, okay? And I have to be very sensitive. There are no free rides, you know? Fair. Yes. In, in families, you have to be more. And, and I've told you this before, we're a circus family. When you want to bring up, that's what we are. We work very hard. We love each other and we respect each other. And we get up high on the high wire and, 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 and we, on the trap, and we never drop the other person. That's ultimately our credo. But um, no, people don't always realize that, that who is related. But I changed my name and The Godfather, because I, I just didn't want there to be an issue, you know, nepotism right. issue. Right, and Coppola is very, now, uh, Nicolas Cage, who's your nephew, yes. he's also technically a Coppola too, right? But he he's changed Coppola. We're all Co- We are all Coppolas. Um, Nicholas. <clears throat> all right, my family, three of us. August Coppola was the first. My brother passed away 10 years ago the most brilliant mind, Dean of Creative Arts, San Francisco State, created the sensorium in San Francisco that is called the Touch Museum. Who else but August? And I cannot tell, and he was our teacher, my teacher and Francis's teacher. Three extraordinary boys. Nicholas Christopher, uh, uh, Nicholas is my nephew, Francis. Uh, We had the 
had three three children. We lost Gia, wonderful talent. We have uh, Roman and Sophia, wonderful talents. I'm the baby. Oh, and you're always the baby, let me tell you. I don't care if I'm 100, I'm the baby. And I have five between us, yours, mine, and ours. I, I changed it a little bit. And my two stepchildren are extraordinary. Stephanie Schwartzman, John Schwartzman, is a great cinematographer. He's doing Jurassic Park right now. Oh, cool. Right? Got a nomination, by the way. For, I'm giving you all the fans. Yeah, fancy. all of it. But that's the thing. All right. And he also shot the opening on Rad as a 19-year-old. And then there's Matthew Shire from David Shire, my first husband, who is an Oscar-winning composer and my friend. Those things don't, we're, as I said, we're artists are a species. Then there's the most, you know, magnificent Jason. Well, actually, uh, Jason Schwartzman, I think many people know him. Matthew Shire from David and myself is very talented, wonderful writer, has done many TV works. And then there is the, the Robert Schwartzman, our baby, who has directed many things. Jason and Robert both had bands. Yesterday was a meaningful day for me because I lost my husband many years ago and yesterday was Jack's birthday, uh, would be his birthday. And in a, in a strange kind of way that there is love and loss, he was sort of orbiting nearby. And I was thinking about uh, us and various things and I remember we talked you and I, there was a moment we had, and you said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, rad, because it was a movie, really it was part of Jack's company, um, 1986. And you asked me why, and I said, because his sons, big deal, Robert Schwartzman, who lost Jack at 11, and people out there have lost, they know, who was only four when this was made, has been the force behind this. That's a big deal. Father, son, Lion King, wow. And I, I said, Rad, you know, can we discuss Rad? Also meaningful because Robert is one month away, he and his wife, Zoe, from having twin boys. And they sent me the sonogram, right? And it said, Ju July 22nd, these two little boys. And I went, so I'm gonna, I gotta tell you, Rad. Rad is a wonderful movie, and you can see it and screen it on Altavod, and eventually it'll be out yet again in a, a big DVD printing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's more than just a movie. It is a, it's a big deal of, of a son and a father and, and a family. And by the way, I'm going to add something too about Rad because after you told me about it on Sunday, mm -hmm. I was looking it up and whatnot. I couldn't get it yet because it's not re-released yet, but it will be by the time this is running. So you can get it on yeah. demand. And yes. your son, Robert, did. It's been restored. And I believe it's available in 4K, which is like the highest quality. And it's going to look great. And I also did a little more research and I could see that it's a huge cult favorite movie from the 80s, I think it was 1986. From the 80s. So, mm -hmm. but now everybody should go check it out and it's gonna be available, I believe, on demand. Well, rather than in bought, and it had a big DVD printing, but yeah. it will have another one. Restored, you know, being restored. the metaphysical person that I am, you know what, what I, I, it restores uh, father to sons. That's what it's restoring. So I, I had Beautiful. to say, because I'm real proud. So we are musicians, actors, writers, cinematographers. What else are we? Cooks, we cook wonderful pasta for Zool. That's Italian dish. Um, yeah, it's are. incredible. I mean, I guess it's not, it kind of, you would think <laughs> it runs in the family because whether it's genetic, it's nature or nurture, it's probably both, right? So there's probably all of that together, but you all, passed it down in so many ways. It's so cool, really. So Jason also, just for- very difficult. What you're saying is, now I'm gonna be a mystic, all okay. right? I'm gonna shift. There is a kind of passing it down, but there's also kind of genetic karma and karma. 
And we all have stories. We all have storylines. Mm -hmm. We all have family issues that get passed down. You understand this as a therapist. Our job while we're in this physical body, enjoying our roles in a family, is to make things conscious. By the way, that's what, is, that's what theater is about stories and how things get passed on. But isn't it interesting that I was just saying that to my, my, typing it to my son this morning, look, we have to take certain looks at things because things get passed down and our job is to become conscious. Fair, okay, so that you do as part of your acting, that just blends right, folds right into everything. Right in. Absolutely, because the study, if, if I, I mean, honestly, if, a fan may say, a person who loves, wants to be an actor will say, an actor, what? Well, Arto said this, an actor is an athlete of the heart. A great old French actor, turn of the century, true. But we get crazy because we want, you know, uh, the glory and are we know, you could be in an acting company in a little regional company changing the world. I could be using my skills out on the street because I understand how to take a situation, maybe shape it so that the other person, my partner at the fruit stand, may have a moment with me. So acting is, is art and beauty, psychology, metaphysics, uh, dance, movie. it's everything. And why I love it. That's why you love it and that's why you're good at it. Right, because I'm sure not everybody approaches it from all those different angles either, so. Most do. Yeah? Yeah, you'd be surprised. We don't talk, talk about, oh, some are there eight by tens. I understand. <laughs> we get scared, you know, we get scared. We get, that's a beauty, by the way, of Chorus Line. If you remember, all of you remember that show, it starts this way. I, did I get that job? I really need that job. It's all about that. And then the expression happens as we, we see all these wonderful people. Sure, we're scared. We live from job to job. But the essence of acting and theater, which is thousands of years old, speaks to uh, transformation. So uh, tell me about freedom and what you think about freedom. <laughs> I love and you. It's and responsibility and concepts like that, that I know that you think about a lot because you are very conscious. Well, I, I you know, uh, someone once told me, you know, I said, okay, I've, I, I was younger then. I've got, and I kept on saying, I have to get to this place. And he looked at me and he said, but nothing is static. You're a being, it's beingness. We're always in the act of becoming. That's the beauty of being in this body. It's really hard to have this experience because we're, and that's why we, we always, all of us, I hope, struggle for the higher part of, uh, of experience as we are becoming. All right, freedom. I remember saying, my brother Augie, remember the great, Professor said, hey, because he had wonderful students, and he used to tell them, freedom means responsibility. And I used to tell my children, when they were children, if you're going to bungee jump, which I'm all for, are you anchored? Anchored. We, we, we don't put that together. We are hearing... This in this moment of time, everybody's saying, well, I am free and I'm, I'm listening very carefully. That's not freedom. We are in a moment in time that is transitional, transformational. We feel it in the streets. No, nope. we have to be careful about being judgmental, but we must evaluate. Those two things are very different. We have to evaluate. And I am all for responsibility, freedom if it is anchored in responsibility, this could be a great moment in time, a rebirth for our, our country, because boy, this is a great country. You know, it, it, this, this, my grandmother, my grandfather, 
Francesco Panino, you ask about my family, was a songwriter in Naples. He came to America. He was the piano player for Caruso too, by the way. He came here and he wrote a song about the Statue of Liberty. This is a big deal, this country. And you know, it's hard work to be an American citizen, hard work. Hard work, you can't just say, "My, I can be free. No, you have to be responsible. So, and then you want it, I mean, listen, you know me, I'm just a mother at the end of the day. Yeah, but you know, that is interesting. It is sort of a different take than, than I, I really hear now. You know, everybody's talking about what's going on in the world, da, da, in America, but it is interesting, right? It's a big deal and it's a big responsibility. To be or, an American is right. a big responsibility. A big respons point. And you have the right, that's what Sylvester was right, to go the distance. Okay, let's do this now. I just want to ask you a few questions. We'll pivot a little, and I want to ask you some general questions about life. You know how our podcast was? We just talked, and you know, I did ask you some questions about the Godfather and Rocky and life or whatever, but a lot of it was just us naturally going wherever we went, just like our phone call that was not recorded the other day and our just our good friendship phone call. So oh, I and love- really a real friendship, a real intimacy uh, between us. I I, so. I, yes, I love it. I'm thrilled about it. And I had a great Sunday afternoon talking to you, with you, back and forth. So equal, back and forth. You know what I mean? It's, it was wonderful. Um, and that's just the way that we are. So what was my point in this? Um, we have a, 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 a good flow here, you and I. Mm -hmm. Always. And it's appreciated by me to you. And by me to you. I receive. Big problem for me. I'll receive. Okay. Oh, is that a big problem for you? Well, you know, that, well, you know, pe there's exhaling and inhaling and the interval between. But you could say there's giving and taking or giving and receiving. I love, I, receptivity. My, my ability to, to, because I feel deeply. So I often, and I, on all levels, I'm intuiting on all levels the, the other, the experience. So to receive for me, I have to be, the dose of it is, is uh, I'm, I'm mindful of that. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm always tuning in, like, to me, to be intuitive is my thing too. And to be, I'm always curious about what, Whoever I'm with or whoever I'm talking to, I am, I'm not like preoccupied with how they're experiencing the situation, but I am curious about it. And I, especially as an interviewer, when people leave after we've talked, I do often wonder like, well, how was that experience for that person? You know, and I really do want to know. And anyway, we're talking too much well, no, about my have, interviews. You know, I don't know. You have a family with you. Yeah. In your, in your, we are all quarantining. Mm -hmm. I'm in this house with three dogs. That's it. <laughs> crazy. So um, somebody walks through outside. It's, it's a little crazy. So I have, and I have found these uh, new ways that we are using technology to have back and forth. By the way, I'm, I, I don't know how to work most things, but boy, I'm on Zoom today, big deal. So I, I'm finding it very exciting to have this flow of conversation with you. And, and important for me, I needed to have this conversation and I need a haircut too. You know? <laughs> I got a haircut last week. Oh, really? You went I, out? I, I did. So this is what I did. This was my approach. Again, this is not going to be on the, I'm not going to air this part. Oh, of this might be very important. Okay. So this is oh. what I decided was. So as you know, I'm in the suburbs of New York city. So we were the epicenter. Good pizza. Oh, I know. Yes. I'm on the pizza, but you were in the Yes. Well, good pizza, oh. good bagels, good culture, a lot of good things happening over here, but oh, we were the disease. Yeah. Yeah, so we were the epicenter of coronavirus just a couple of months ago. So we were like the worst spot. And now 
we are the only place in the country that has completely gone down. Like it's been a massive decrease in cases and deaths and everything, the hospitals, everything is so good here, relatively speaking, compared to the rest of the country. So mm -hmm. as the, the rates are going up everywhere, as you know, where you are too, and the, yeah. the South and exactly. exactly. Yeah. And I'm where I wear that all the time. My fans don't see it because they don't see me when I'm here at home. I don't wear the mask, but I always have worn the mask when I step out and I don't go that many places. I go outdoors, whatever. But I thought to myself a couple of weeks ago, it's getting so bad everywhere else that it will be impossible for it not to creep back into my area ge geographically. That's not gonna, there's no way that you can keep it out when people start traveling. So I said to myself, maybe now I should get all my doctor's appointments taken care of, the ones that I was due for before, go to the dentist, go for my annual exam, get the haircut, do it all so that if it gets worse here, because this is right now probably the safest it's been, and what if it's not going to be that way anymore? This will be the time to do it and then not have to do it later. Does that make do sense? It. Do it. I did it. I did it all. Well, you did. And you got a haircut. I got a text this morning from my vet that Luca, Chica, and Zazalita must come in for their... And I'm thinking, you know, how can I get my dogs in? I've never had to ponder. How do I get my dogs in? But we are all, all of us here, all of us. And, you know, people, by the way, somebody who says, I don't want to wear, wear a mask for heaven's sakes. There are, are studies, there's science on it. We're getting close to a vaccine, but for heaven's sakes. For the sake of heaven, I love that term. The sake of heaven, not hell. Heaven, wear the mask. It's interesting. I mean, wear it. But I'm trying to figure out how to get my dogs in, and I would like to get a haircut. Well, I don't know if the dogs need it, but for the haircut. So here's what else I did. I'll tell you a little story. I bought one of the right. Yeah. So uh, I looked at my salon to see when they when the salons opened back up. I wasn't planning to go, but my hair started to get so big, and I was like, I really just need to trim it. And I looked at my salon. I went online and I saw they they were on Facebook. Like they don't have a website. They have, they're on Facebook. So I looked on on their Facebook page, and what do I see? I see a picture of all the hairstylists together outside of the salon, arm in arm, not a mask to be found. And I thought, that's not a good sign. An old picture? No, new because they had t-shirts saying, like we beat, or what was it? Corona, something about coronavirus. So they got back together. There were probably a dozen stylists arm in arm, no mask. So I'm like, I can't go back here. I'm not going to go to this salon. So I went to another salon that had been on TV because they were donating cuts to healthcare workers. And they showed all the stuff with the, the masks and the glass partition and everything. And so I was like, I'm going to go to this place because I can tell it's safe. And the, the procedures were incredibly safe with the, you know, you wait in your car, you check in there, and then you, they have you Purell. You didn't drive in and they did it through the window or the car? That would be nice. Well, they didn't blow dry. The bubble of the roof, you stamp, no, nothing like, forget it. <laughs> but they didn't blow dry my hair. They did it just over in one section where there wasn't anybody. So mm -hmm. I felt okay. That was a couple of weeks ago. I did it all in one, one fell swoop to get everything taken care of. So here we are again, talking about <laughs> everything. No, but you know, if, if you're a playwright, this could be a scene in a small Tennessee Williams moment. Ha, didn't go, did you stand? You know, a Southern, I was doing a Southern accent. The point is, what you're telling me is we are talking about stuff that turns up in plays. I can't get my dog's toenails cut. It's a big paw. These are, these are ridiculous. And then you also mentioned that they, uh, your, this salon was donating to healthcare workers on the front line. So all of a sudden, the conversation in a play would be, did you hear? They're cutting the hair of those on the front line. And by the way, that's, that is extraordinary that they would acknowledge that those people are putting their lives on the line. On, honest to God. Honest to God. It was great. I loved it. I'm like, this is all I needed to say. You're right. Absolutely. And no, but I'm, the in our, I'm in our playwriting scene because that's my point of view is I bring it in through, 
through drama and text and I write it down is what you just shared with me is fascinating. It's and life. that you picked a place that made donations to those people who really are saving lives. Big deal. That's right. That's right. I mean, for me, there are many acts of kindness and respect that I'm experiencing. How about you? Are you? Yeah, getting- I would say so too. Um, you know, I'm not out and about that much anymore. I'm always home, right? <laughs> so- yeah, and I'm with the dogs. Yes, but you know what? It's funny because this is like not even... Um, big human contact, but I noticed the other day that I feel like I've gotten better customer service from certain companies. This is so weird since the pandemic began. I'm serious. Like I've had a couple of things where I had to call a company for one reason or another. One was Zappos and I was just returning a pair of shoes. And, uh, uh, the other one was like Shutterfly. I had a problem with the mug, you know, this mug that I was, that I got done. It like wasn't right. So I t- was talking to them and I was like, they were giving me all this time. They seemed happy, content. And I think, you know, maybe it's because they're working from home and some of us have gotten really be able to put things in perspective about how lucky we are if we're not, if we haven't been swept up in the pandemic, which we're all swept up in it, but you know what I mean? Where if, you know, we're healthy and, uh, you know, there's so much else going on right now that still is so upsetting. But anyway, my point was, I think some good, some good things, some, some gestures, some kindness, like you were saying, some silver lining. I think people want contact. They want to know you are my brother, you're my sister. Hey, we're in this together. There is humanity. Uh, so I feel uh, it's awful. People are dying, losing their businesses. I mean, it's, I, have to, I have to know that. That's anchoring in certain realities. But I have to see the celebration and or celebrate the humanity I'm also experiencing. And and can I see your cup again? <laughs> I don't. I, you popped it up. Oh well, okay. See it? Really they did famous. A great, I think they did a great job. It's kind of the moon or the sky or. So they did a good job, um, but the problem is, if I'm going to try to help you see it, is that it's not I even. Saw- it's not even. So if I hold it up like the logo is a little far off. So some people, I had a picture on my Instagram the other day of me with this mug. I was like saying cheers to everybody. And then a lot of people said, I've got to have one of those mugs. So I was like, oh, okay. So maybe I can get more of these mugs and sell them. So I, I but I wanted them to be um, lined up better because the logo is just kind of too far off. So I wanted to make it better. If I'm going to charge people for a mug, I wanted it to be perfect for them. So I ordered a few. I had the, the woman at Shutterfly kept trying to change it herself. So she spent like, I'm telling you, probably 45 minutes with me on the phone trying to get the design She's right. Trying. She's trying. A human yes. being is behind that voice. Yes. And aside, a digression, the first Rocky, all kinds of mistakes because of money. So Sylvester stuck on a, I think it was, uh, you know, what, what do you call when you go into the ring, one of those satin? Yeah, yeah, like a robe. But it, the, the, the logo or his name was in the wrong place. It kind of dipped down low and it was in the wrong place. And we laughed after we weren't so happy. But it was one of those imperfect moments that lives in that first Rocky that that accumulates into this unique yes. piece. So I like your logo. I feel what you're saying. I'm going to go with it. I totally Perfect. get you. It's offbeat. Leave and it. then I can put a thing, a stamp of approval. Talia Shire approved. I said so. I love it. I do actually. It's actually beautiful. I'm going to send you. Do you want me to send you one? Yeah. I'm going to send you one. And I'll tell you why I like it because it's, it is very much... You know, the moon is, if, or is the, considered the feminine principle, those celestial archetypal things. Anyway, so it's kind of the moon, but it's also the sky, and it's also a porthole on a long trip, and it's kind of beautiful. I like it. Leave it. I love it. You're going to be getting one of these. So this is perfect. I think that's a perfect place to end, don't you? We'll end it. If you like this talk,
off with Talia. I think you will love my conversation with Danny Aiello, who is also in The Godfather. Do you remember? He even contributed a line that was not part of the script. You'll hear all about that and a lot more. And if you want to catch the red, I will put a link down below. Thanks for watching. See you next time. You know, they say acting is being private in public. So we are having a public thing, but this is private, right? You are my friend. I so appreciate you. I feel exactly the same way. If you like this video, please make sure you smash that like button and tap on subscribe for more Real Talks with your favorite celebrities. If you didn't like it, that's okay. Make sure you tell all your friends to check out Really Famous with Kara Mayer Robinson. They're the worst videos ever. You've got to check them out. Thanks for watching. See you soon.